Hi, good morning, everybody. Welcome to fall 2016. This is a... Uh, 52nd year of Cuesta College offering classes both day and evening on, on this site in San Luis Obispo County. It's, uh, it's, it's becoming a very uh, reflective time in my career in terms of looking, at, looking back and seeing the progress that this district and this county and this college and its multiple sites have accomplished over that period of time. And those of you who have been here a long time, I think, can share uh, that sense of pride and ownership and being part of the story that has developed Cuesta College. And for those of you who are new, new like in less than 10 years, <laughs> I would do a little side story. There's a group in San Luis Obispo that the only way you can belong to this group and go to their barbecues and so on, you have to live in San Luis Obispo County for 50 years or more. Okay. So one day I got a phone call from one of the members, and he said, uh, Gil, we'd like to invite you to attend this gathering. And I said, oh, great. That would be really nice. He said, how long have you lived here? I said, well, I've lived in San Luis Obispo for 48 years. He goes, sorry. <laughs> Click. I mean, I mean, that's hardcore, you know, I mean, <laughs> there's no gray area, it's just black and white. But for those of you who have been here for less than 10 years, yeah, I hope your journey has been, been in joyful, challenging, and also rewarding. Uh, I know it's been challenging, because what's happened over the last, you know, five to seven years, because uh, we've all, those of us who have been here that long, have all in enjoyed, endured, and successfully come out of the, the gloom. Um, so I want to welcome you today and thank you all for being here. Today's also a first. We shut down the North County campus so we could have all of those employees who work up there and who have not been privileged to be able to be here, maybe over Polycom, to be part of the assembly today. So I want to welcome all of our North County uh, employees. Thank you. I want to thank uh, also our Interim Vice President for Student Services, Pat Ewens, for actually uh, instigating that and working with Dr. Uh, Escobedo to make that happen. So thank you, Pat. Thank you. So um, I'm going to ask uh, our two Vice Presidents, Pat Ewens and also Dr. Wolf, uh, to come forward and they're going to introduce you to our newest employees here at Cuesta College. Um, Dr. Wolf is going to be introducing the academic affairs employees, and Vice President Ewens is going to be introducing the student services, the president's cluster, and also administrative services, since Vice President Troy, who some of you haven't met yet, is in Brooklyn uh, attending a, a uh, family reunion which happens every two years. And when I hired him last spring, he gave me the warning that his mother would not let him not come, you know. <laughs> so he was under duress ever since he started here on April 21st, so. Anyway, we have uh, almost 60 new employees that we want to introduce you to or employees who have had significant changes in their work assignment. And so who's gonna start? Are you gonna start? Okay, Dr. Wolf, thank you. Good morning. Welcome to the 1617 academic year. You know, this is my favorite time of the year. And um, before I start reading the names, I just want to say one thing. 1516 was an amazing year for us because we had so many new initiatives and projects. And I challenge you today to talk to your fellow colleagues across, across campus in every department to see what they're doing that is really impacting our student success and is very unique. So have some conversations. All right, so when I um, call your name, and this is in academic affairs, the new hires, will you please stand up if you're here? Kelly Bartell, who's in nursing, allied health. Kelly's in, okay, Kelly. 
Maybe, maybe we'll hold our applause until the end. <laughs> Might be really slow. <laughs> okay, Karen Bishop, who is a faculty member in social sciences. Britta Blue, who's secretary three in administrative scheduling. Ava Brown, Ava, I know you're here. Uh, she is now the assistant to the Dean of Workforce and Economic Development. Uh, Madeline Cavalier, teacher of academic affairs support. Uh, Malia Christensen, you all know Malia, probably the most friendly person on the campus. She's not here today, it's her birthday, and she's the new technician. Michelle Craig, she is a new faculty member in the Fine Arts History Department. Uh, Quay Dang, Quay, stand up please. Quay is our new equity director and student success centers. We're very excited to have her. Casey DiBernardi, who is a supervisor of the tutorial centers and success centers. Elizabeth D. Seward, human development, fine and performing, oh, human development. I got Nancy Douglas. Where are you, Nancy? Yay, Nancy. So Nancy is the uh, human development, no, fine and performing arts support coordinator. Right, Nancy? <laughs> Great. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. Kelsey Edwards, Human Development. Scott Faree is Faculty ESL. Richard Facillo, Fine Arts Instructional Assistant. Sarah Hawkins is Community Programs. Lily Holzner, Secretary 2 of Workforce and Economic Development. Jody Johnson, Library Technician 3. Amy Kaiser, Amy has stepped into the role as division chair of, of uh, development, student success and development. Uh, Amy Klingenberg is a new faculty ESL member. John Knudsen is our new division chair for performing arts. Brent Lamon is a new division chair for social sciences. Uh, Moran Lizdati is a faculty mathematics member. Great to have you here. Uh, uh, let's see, John Patrick Caffey is a faculty member of WED. Uh, Arkea Marshall, faculty, human development. Madeline Medeiros is the new interim dean of humanities, fine arts, and social sciences. And I just have to say thank you, Madeline, for stepping up into that role. Katie Mervin, Faculty of Human Development. Martin Mimak, Faculty of WD and CP. Lana Thine Hong, oh, I'm sorry, Lana Nelson, Enrollment Specialist. Thine Hong, Nye, Faculty of Social Sciences. Shrey Almeida, she is the VPAA's assistant. Rebecca Posey, Communications. Gabriel Quaroz, Faculty of WED. Stephanie Romero, Faculty of the Business Education. Um, Emma Saperstein, she is now the coordinator of the Miosi Art Gallery. Don Stewart, Faculty of Performing Arts. Lorena Wagner is a Children's Center Assistant Supervisor. Cynthia Wilhusen, Cynthia, are you here? Yay, Cynthia. This is a position, faculty position that we've been trying to get for 10 years, so we're very excited to have Cynthia in that role. And please, go to Cynthia if you need any help at all on distance education or with um, Canvas. Karen Wilson, nursing faculty member. Yes, so to all of you, welcome aboard, welcome to the Cuesta family, and have a great year. Good morning. As I look down this list of all of the new people that are joining um, Cuesta College, myself included, it's, it's pretty cool. It's to have people like Dr. Stork who have been here 50 years and to have people coming in the door who are here for their first day, uh, the continuity and the infusion of new ideas and new blood is just a wonderful thing. Uh, it's been my pleasure. This is the end of my fourth week. At, uh, at Cuesta, so I'm an old hand here. Uh, I have actually found my way around the Student Services Building, and I don't have to leave a breadcrumb trail any longer. Um, but it is my 40th fall semester in education, so I'm not a newbie. 
and uh, it's, it's a pleasure to have that to celebrate my 40th year here at Cuesta with you. Let me introduce the new uh, faculty and staff that are joining student services and administrative services and the president's office. I have their picture. Are there pictures coming? There's no pictures. <laughs> okay. I saw their pictures. Okay. All right, so they're going to have to stand up. Now, what, what, what I'd like us to do, instead of clapping for everybody, because I know we really want to clap for each person, as they stand up, I'd like everybody to just give one big, and at the end, we'll clap for everybody. Okay, okay, let's practice. Okay, okay we're going to practice. One big clap. Okay. Okay, okay Shanna Ahrens is an interim supervising accountant. Juan Carranza is a new police officer with us. Marvin Cheeks is a skilled maintenance carpenter cabinet maker locksmith. Oh my gosh. Okay. Ellen, uh, Elaine Janassi is a clerical assistant in counseling. And Emily Hinkle is a facilities services special event and project assistant. And Brian Millard is our director and police and college safety services officer. Okay. And I'm losing my place. Okay. And Catherine Nelson is an accounting technician. Leobardo Neri is a new custodian with us. Miles O'Connor, computer services technician. James Rash is a custodian. Barry Smith is a programmer with IT. Dan Troy is our new vice president of administrative services. Judith Violette is a student accounts technician. Janelle Blue is an HR specialist. Tim Bowker is also an HR analyst. Stephanie Federico is an HR analyst. I'm doing a lot of analyzing in HR. Okay. Okay. Vicki Almagar is a student success and support program technician. Regina Dines is a financial aid technician. Patricia Ewens, oh, that's me. Patricia Ewens. <laughs> is the Vice President of Student Services. Okay. And Bonnie Gordon is an Enrollment Success Specialist. Riley Hash is a Student Health Services Assistant. Erin Lestredo is an Associate Director of Student Success and Support Programs. Daniel Lynch is a new Faculty Counselor. And Norberto Marroquin is a Faculty Counselor. And Lizette Martin is a new faculty counselor. Yay. And Monica Mercer, administrative scheduling assistant to the dean. And Allison Phelps, student life and leadership activities assistant. Ali Roselli, a new faculty counselor. Julie Salgado, financial aid technician. Cindy Sanchez, bilingual student services site specialist. Heidi Weber, faculty counseling, and Frances Wheeler, a nurse in our Student Health Services Center. Round of applause for everybody. Isn't technology wonderful? We had two versions of that, one which is a looping one and one which uh, we managed uh, by hand and we've got the wrong one. So, <laughs> been there, done that, you know, it happens. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Terry Lynn uh, forward. Where's Terry Lynn? Okay. Terry Lynn is our Director of Human Resources, Payroll and uh, Benefits and uh, she's going to help me during this uh, part of the program. And uh, we have uh, several employees who are reaching milestones in their uh, employment here at Cuesta College, and so we're going to recognize those employees who have completed five years of service, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, and we have a 45-year recipient. So, um, so Terry Lynn, if you'll come up and uh, read these names, and then when your name is read in the group, please come forward, and we'll stand in here. We'll give you your, your absolute rock-solid important pin, 
I don't want you to wear everywhere you go, pajamas, bathing suit, whatever it is, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and we'll get a, a quick uh, group photo of each of the classes, and, uh, and we'll go from there. All right, so this is Terry Lynn. Good morning. Um, we ask, like, as we've done before, kind of hold the applause till the end of that year of people, okay? So I'm going to start with five years. John Cascamo, Marvin Cheeks, Sandra Contreras, Kelly Ferguson, Claire Hawkins, <laughs> Shannon Hill, Jennifer Madrid, Joe Miller, Julie Munoz, Shannon Piper, Brian Potter, Lisa Purcell, Raymond Robertson, Scott Severn, Leah Waterbury, Robert Whiteford, and Nabil Zakaria. That's it for five years. All right, moving on to 10 years. Vicki Almaguer, Jose Arroyo, Robert Del Fiorentino, Angie Edmonds, Todd Frederick, Lisa Gray, Anthony Gutierrez, Mark Hunter, Mia Ruiz, Albert Silva, Mehdi Solomoncani, Paul Sullivan, and Regina Vogue. Moving along, 15 years. Alejandra Aguirre, Jeannie Amateur, Karen Andrews, Judy Beyer, Grant Chessy, Lisa Curtis, Miriam Feliciano Hicks, Manuel Hernandez, Jean Lalou, Robert Mariucci. John Moore, <laughs> Regina Vrend, Stephen Watkins, and Nancy Webb. All right, 20 years. Julianne Jackson. <laughs> Terry Katz. Eric McDonald. Terry Reese. Vicki Schemmer. And Pete Schuler. <laughs> All right, 25 years. Celeste Brown, Colin Campbell, and Lori Yoshiyama.
<laughs> All right, 30 years. Dana Goff. The next two that I name have already retired as of June, but I still wanted to recognize their 30 years here. So that was Sandy McLaughlin and Irene Nunez. All right, we're at 35 years. Trudy Bell. She's selling books, okay. All right, 45 years. Terry Croxton. Okay, thank you. Well, congratulations to all of you who have hit that milestone. Um, and it's, uh, those of you who are sitting at four or nine or 14, you, you know what's gonna happen the next year, you know, so you kind of get your stuff. So uh, don't be absent just because you don't want to come up and be recognized, you know. But anyway, um, those who aren't here today, we will uh, be delivering uh, their awards and recognitions to them. So we'll go over in the bio lab and dig out Terry Croxton <laughs> from all the frogs and the critters. <laughs> if Ron Rupert can you know, unbury it, he's the only who knows where all the skeletons are. So, yeah. Anyway, so this uh, time of the uh, program uh, is when we do our recognition of employees that you have identified uh, within your particular groups have been outstanding in the work that they have been doing. These are nominations done by the faculty for the Academic Employee of the Year. The classified employees select and nominate the classified employee of the year and management senate for the manager of the year. And so um, I'll announce the uh, academic employee uh, first. And I'd like for you to welcome to the podium Sherry Moore. Is Sherry here? Now, Sherry, these are some of the comments that your, your nominee, uh, nominators uh, indicated here. The ones I could repeat, that is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it says, Sherry's commitment and selfless effort exceed the expectations and reassign time of the curriculum chair. She provides oversight for curriculum and ensures that all courses have been approved through an effective and efficient process. Sherry has been instrumental in responding to accreditation recommendations addressing quality assurance in distance education courses. Sherry is also thorough in her research and works until solutions are found. Her contribution to the successful implementation of the associate degrees for transfer has been significant, which has contributed to student success. Sherry actively participated in 12 college committees in 15-16 and engages in a knowledgeable and professional manner. So Sherry, congratulations and well-deserved. Jack, to say something? Okay. All right, I, I just, whoever nominated me and did this, thank you. I'm very, very honored. And I still, everything here is a team effort. Everything I do is a team effort. It's always a group, always a team. So many people could be up here, but I really appreciate those for recognizing me for 
for this. Thank you. I'm very, very honored. Isn't that fun? That's fun. <laughs> Nominated and selected as the Classified Employee of the Year, please welcome Claudia Faraday. Claudia's uh, nomination included these comments. Claudia is a dedicated and enthusiastic program specialist who holds genuine concern for Quest's nursing and allied health students. She is a key player in multiple renewal processes for several accredited programs within the department. She maintains thorough knowledge of each program and the associated application processes and requirements. She is a forward thinker instrumental in planning program orientations and graduations and tracking department administrative requirements. She exhibits a nurturing nature towards students, ensuring they have the information needed to work towards success. Claudia's considerate and focused efforts are critical to the success of the nursing and allied health programs. So Claudia, congratulations. Wow, um, I'm really not good at surprises, but um, <laughs> I just want to say um, I feel really fortunate to work with such uh, amazing and dedicated people, and I want to thank all of you for uh, making Cuesta a great place to be and to be proud of. Thank you. <laughs> And the recipient for the Management Senate Employee of the Year, please welcome Kristen Pimentel. The whole fam damley's here, yeah. <laughs> well, this is a, a, a special occasion, and um, it's too bad that w this didn't happen last year when, when Kristen's father was still alive. He would have been so proud of Kristen and her accomplishments, being a former Cuesta student, softball player, and now being part of the Cuesta family for so many years and overcoming her challenges in life. And so to be recognized by her peers as the Management Center of the Employee of the Year is really special. Congratulations, Kristen. <clears throat> yeah. So here are the comments from her colleagues. Kristen reorganized the department and improved the student experience. She has created an environment where employees are empowered to be creative and effective uh, in effect, positive change to process and procedure. She serves as the co-chair of the, of the MyQuesta Pathway. Degree works went active ahead of schedule. Kristen led the effort in updating board policy within her department and was instrumental in implementing and improving student transcript services. She's been an integral leader in the collaboration of several efforts supporting student support and success including dual enrollment, Zoom, and instruction provided at the men's colony. Kristen is an effective manager who digs in and leads from the front. Kristen, congratulations. Mm. 
Wow, I'm speechless. I have to do this. I spoiled the surprise. For those of you who know that I'm hearing impaired, I have a battery in my hearing aid. It was going out. So I went out the door and I see these two here. So <laughs> I was like, oops. Um, anyway, uh, anyway, I thank you all. And it's great working here um, at Quest to Call. So thank you. Now, if I can invite uh, Lara Baxley forward. Lara is the president of the Academic Senate and chemistry faculty member who will present the Teaching Excellence Award. Hello, hello everyone. Congratulations to those winners so far. Excellent choices. Um, so I am honored to be here today to present the Teaching Excellence Award to a faculty member who epitomizes excellence in our profession and who provides great resources and encouragement to our students. The Teaching Excellence Award, which is sponsored by the Foundation, recognizes faculty who show leadership in course organization, presentation, while keeping current with educational methodology. Uh, the recipient is honored with a $500 check and a beautiful commemorative plaque. So, Please. <laughs> Thank you, Vanna. <laughs> you guys are all excited about this. I'm, I'm going to hold out for a little longer. No. Please join me in congratulating this year's Teaching Excellence Award, Chris Gilbert. Okay, I'm going to also read from Chris's nomination letter. Uh, Dr. Gilbert is a valued professor of the philosophy, of philosophy at Cuesta College. He is the epitome of collegiality, diligence, and professionalism. You all know that, don't you? He is held in high regard by faculty across disciplines and has been an asset to Cuesta College during his tenure here. When one thinks of the ideal college professor, Chris fits the description to a T. Chris is a master of his discipline and a master teacher. His method, method, sorry, I don't, I can't say the word. <laughs> <laughs> method, <laughs> methodological <laughs> style, pace, and skill allow him to make complex ideas clear, unlike myself. <laughs> <laughs> okay, furthermore, his high energy, passion for the topic, and sense of humor keep students engaged and participating throughout the class period. Dr. Gilbert's skills are also acknowledged by his students who have commented that he is clear, concise, and well organized that he presents complicated material in a way that is organized and easily understood, that he asks very thought-provoking questions for essays, and that he challenges students to think about the material themselves and make the necessary connections. Chris's, Chris's patience, both in the class and during office hours, puts students at ease, and he extends this same patience and cooperation to his colleagues in the social sciences. Chris also works tireless, tirelessly to support Cuesta College students in his role as the faculty advisor for Alpha Gamma Sigma, the Community College Honor Society. In this capacity, he organizes multiple fundraisers benefiting our college and the community of San Luis Obispo. For his success in this area, Chris was honored with a Distinguished Advisor Award at the AGS state level. 
<clears throat> in addition to his success with students, Chris is committed to his professional development and goes well beyond the expectations of a community college faculty member. Recently, he published several works in his field, including a book review, an article, and a logic textbook written specifically with community college students in mind. This level of professional experience is certainly important for fostering student interest among philosophy majors who wish to pursue higher education and achieve their discipline. I'll also add to this myself that Chris has also been the chair of the Institutional Tenure Review Committee for many years and in that role has shepherded many new faculty, including myself, through the tenure process. Chris is an extremely valued member of the Cuesta College faculty community and we are very fortunate to have him here. Congratulations, Chris. Um, I'm very surprised by this. Thank those of you who nominated me. Um, I'd just like to say it's, it's an honor and a privilege to come to work every day and work with as many dedicated people as we have at Cuesta College. I'm amazed by my colleagues day after day, and that's what keeps me going back every day. So thank you. Thanks. Now this. <laughs> Who is that, Susan? Oh, gee. too bad this isn't Rotary. I would have fined her fifty dollars. <laughs> well, um, Chris, one of the things you should know is the fact that your cash award comes in a check from the foundation which means you get the full amount. <laughs> These other ones get awards, but it comes in through payroll. So, you know, what, come out, what comes out of that then is the federal tax, the state tax, the license, the, uh, you know, the parking fee, the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the token to show up at the cafeteria on Wednesdays for uh, Juan's Killer Burritos, uh, and it goes on and on and on, so good luck, yeah. Uh, the, the last award that, um, that I want to uh, give today is called the Dr. Marie E. Rosenwasser President's Leadership Award. Uh, this award was established back in 2003 by Dr. Rosenwasser when she was president. And I want to thank Marie for doing this, because this is one of the, the very few privileges that the president have, has without going through some committee, you know that we get to uh, pick and choose and look to see about exceptional work that's being done uh, within the organization uh, and, and call that out in recognition. And I just want to review uh, the recipients that have received that, some of whom are still here and still surviving. The very first award was given in 2003, um, and that went to uh, Dennis Bayon. Is Dennis here today? Dennis here? Okay. He's, he's still here, but not here. Okay. <laughs> In 2004, um, it was a co-recipients co of that, former Vice President of Instruction, Susan Dressler, and uh, myself serving as the Vice President of Student Services. In 2005, former Vice President Tony Summer was recognized. And then in 2006, Dr. Mary Parker, who is the former uh, Director of our Nursing and Allied Health Program. Then Dr. Rosenwasser left, and Ed Meduli was the interim president, and he selected in 2007 uh, Terry Reese as the recipient. And then we had a new president come in, uh, Dr. Pelham, and he uh, nominated and gave the next two, former vice president, recently retired, Sandy McLaughlin in 2008, and then in 2009, Janice House. When I came back in in 2010 as the, as the president, I renamed the award in honor of Dr. Rosenwasser since she had be begun that. Um, and then I've had the opportunity to give six awards plus today's award. The awards that I have uh, chosen, the people that I have recognized in 2010, and if you're here, please stand, Stacy Pointer, 
I don't know if Stacy's here. In 2011, Margaret Coruscelli. Where's Margaret? I know she's here. There's Margaret back there. Remember, just a clap. In 2010, Dr. Deborah Wolf. One clap, geez. <laughs> it's going to go to her head, you know. In 2013, Allison Merzan. There's Allison. In 2014, Dr. Greg Baxley. And last year, in 2015, Dr. Kevin Bottenball. And it's my honor and privilege today to announce the um, Dr. Marie E. Rosenwasser Leadership Award to Bill Demarest. So Bill. Let me tell you why. Well, let's face it, he's a math guy. Yeah, it's a no brainer. <laughs> Actually, um, I didn't know Bill very well. I just knew him as Sally's husband. You know, yeah, that's how you go through life. You know, you're somebody's dad or somebody's brother or sister or whatever, you know. And, but then I also had the opportunity uh, to also. Uh, interview and select Bill as a, as a full-time tenure track faculty member. Um, and I got to know him better, got to know him better through the reviews I read and the responses that I saw. But this is not about his teaching excellence. This is about what I, what I observed, uh, his uh, role in taking on a, a major responsibility. You know, last year, our effort was in creating a new tenure uh, master plan, educational facilities master plan. And it's a thankless job if you're a full-time faculty member and then tapped to come forward and take on a leadership role in achieving success on such a tremendously important document. So Bill was handpicked to co-chair the educational, facility, educational facilities master plan to serve with Dr. Wolf. And, uh, and he did it amazingly well. He had that ability to uh, not only uh, command the respect of his peers, but he was also has that ability to ask the tough questions, to dig down uh, deeper into the research and the data, to be able to draw conclusions about where we are and where we need to go. So his leadership and his ability to represent faculty, faculty point of view, uh, was, in, it was absolutely instrumental to the success of this project. So, Bill, I want to thank you, number one, for taking on that assignment and doing it so well. And uh, thanks for not screwing it up because it, lo it made me look bad, you know, so. <laughs> but, you know, your, your wife has been receiving so much recognition, it was about time that you kind of, <laughs> you did your share. So, so, Bill, congratulations, and it's nice to have your, are these your, these are your children, aren't they? Last time I saw him was at the pizza kitchen, I think. California, yeah. And so, Bill, congratulations. Wow. Well, gosh, hearing all those names uh, that came before me for this award was just what, what company to keep. I mean, I'm really, I'm really honored. I'm really, um, I'm really blown away. Uh, and I just want to thank, well, first, Sally, of course, <laughs> and, and, and the rest of my family, and uh, Deborah Wolf and Lisa Gray for all the hard work on the committee as well. Uh, it was an honor and, and a, a privilege to work on the committee and get, get that uh, document produced. So I also want to thank all my math colleagues. I mean, what a great group to work with. I love you guys. <laughs> uh, and. <clears throat> As a uh, Cuesta College alumni, I just couldn't be more proud to, to win this award. So thank you all very much. Really appreciate yeah. it.
Okay, so needless to say, what's been happening today is really about the theme of student success. What we do on an everyday basis to contribute to our students achieving their personal self-identified goals. And there's been a lot of activity going on in the campus through the triple SP uh, work and student equity and dollars have been rolling in to colleges throughout California to help support and beef up the support to students. And we have two presentations here this morning that want to highlight that's how that's contributing to what's happening with our students and what kind of resources are going to be available to them. So I'm going to introduce, first of all, Dr. Maria Escobedo, who's uh, the Dean of the North County Campus and, and South County Center, um, and also uh, Bailey Dressler from Human Development, who are going to talk about the, um, the new initiatives and uh, with the Equity Action Committee, formerly known as the Culture, Diversity, and Student Equity Committee. So if uh, Dr. Escobedo and Bailey can come forward. Bailey here? Okay. There we go. And their presentation will then be fo followed by uh, Joan Duffy, who is our coordinator of student health services, and Tanya Hardiman, a counselor who is also assigned to do mental health counseling in our uh, student health center. And their topic is going to be on mental health and student well-being strategies and solutions. So as soon as they're done, then if Joan and Tanya will come forward, we'll continue the program. So thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Let me, let's get oh. this PowerPoint. Oh, does anybody know if my second one is too Spanish? I can do overheads really well. <laughs> kind of dates me, right? Uh, the, so we can get it up there. Good morning, everybody. Um, first and foremost, I'm so glad the North County campus folks are here. Um, I'm a little biased, right? And I want North County closed so they can share the experience of being for opening day. But thank you all. Um, Melissa uh, Richardson, the Vice President of uh, Human Resources, was also going to co-present co -present with us, and she wasn't able to be here. So you've got Bailey and I going over some information. But one of the things that, um, that we, let me see, how can I put this? Let me go back. Hi, everybody. We'll start there. Um, and I'll go back to North County campus being able to be closed. I know that we talk about student success and what we need to do to provide our services for our students. But the other piece that's important is also taking care of uh, our staff. And for staff to be able to experience this wonderful event, and it's very different via Polycom, right? When you're on the other side and people just kind of see you going like this, because I sit at North County quite a bit and doing that. But this is a wonderful experience that they are here to share with us today. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Action Equity Committee, but I want to give you a little bit of background is that I was invited to a meeting late spring. Uh, Sandy and Anthony had said, oh, why don't you come to the committee meeting? And I said, okay, sure. You know, we'll see what it's about. And go, oh, how would you like to be co-chair? I said, oh, I've got to be careful when I accept invitations. So, but it's been a pleasure and a privilege to be working with a committee and some of the things that we have done. Um, a little bit of history, and then Bailey will be able to explain to you a little bit more because she's been around this campus and around this committee and her passion uh, for student equity. But a couple of things that, that had happened in the last year, and the original uh, name, as Dr. Stork had mentioned, is the Cultural and Diversity and Student Equity Committee, which encapsulated, encapsulated everything that was being done at the time. It, in 2014-15, the, the committee talked about how, do we, how can we change the name to really capture what the changes that are taking place in our world. Um, in the latter part of 20, uh, spring of 2016, the committee finally made a decision to change the name of Equity Action Committee. And the goal of, of the new name was really to capture the current trends that are happening in our, in our population. It also, it created a stronger language uh, for what we are doing with our diverse population, not only with students, but with our staff. It also um, was more inclusive. 
uh, how do you, what terms do you use, what letter, what words do you use to be more inclusive into our changes that are taking place? And that took about a year and a half. Uh, have any of you been in any committees? It takes a little while to get things moving. But there was a, an exceptional dialogue and coming in from the different perspectives, from a faculty perspective, uh, where the faculty members are in that committee and what they see in the classroom and what they're teaching, how their course syllabi is, how they're embedding um, learning. One of the wonderful accomplishments that we had during this past year is uh, supporting and, and uh, the Educate Si Se Puede conference, which we know that has been a tremendous event that has grown over the years. And I, my understanding is that this year they were capped out. Uh, they had several students that were on the campus. We also supported the Learning Disabilities Conference that has been brought back to the institution, poetry and translation event, Dia de los Muertos event that has taken place in, in, uh, in November, book of the year. Um, we also created an affirmation, which is what Bailey is going to uh, talk about here uh, re uh, in a few moments. But we've also collaborated with the IEC um, committee in reviewing and ensuring that we had diversity questions in the surveys that are done for our students to really capture who our students are. And one of the other things that I've been very happy and very proud is that last year, or the first part of the year, we became a Hispanic serving institution, which is no easy thing to get, but we are there. Um, with the help with the help of the uh, institutional research team, we had Anthony on there and other folks on there that we really pushed Janet from grants and contracts to make sure our application and that our numbers were correct. This really captures our change in demographics and our student population. And now we're eligible for more services, more grants as a result of that. Um, but and I think that's my last point. Bailey? Thank you, Maria. I, I want to speak on behalf of the committee and say that the decision to go from a cultural diversity and student equity committee to equity action committee, do I have that right? Equity action? Um, uh, is more than just semantics. You know, we come from this worldview that language does shape our thinking and we want to reflect that um, as best we can. And so we took this language really to heart and we grappled with it. And in doing so, we, um, we know that this is not the permanent written in stone um, name of the committee forever, but we feel like this is the best place to be right now. In that discussion, we also talked about the work that's already being done between us as colleagues and um, between us, uh, between co colleagues and students. And so this affirmation, uh, this affirmation is things that, like I said, many of us are already doing. And we have copies, I believe, yes, we, we do have copies available on the outside. On, oh, right on this table, for you to pick up and to display and actually um, feel free to sign your name at the bottom. This is the heart of our committee and we think it's the heart of the campus here. And I just, uh, you can read for yourself, but I want to just say a couple things about uh, some of the language. So the first one, I respect, value, and speak to understand, seek to understand diverse cultures and personal expressions of identity. I don't have my glasses. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> I am committed to creating a welcoming and supportive classroom and campus environment. I speak out against discrimination in any form. And that we know that this takes courage. Um, we're going to uh, create some workshops where we can talk about those diff difficult dialogues, um, language or conversations we hear in the hall that we don't know how to present or what we hear between students. So be paying attention to that, um, those workshops. And then lastly, I recognize that cultural c humility and self-reflection are critical components of inclusivity and equity. And this, again, these are not buzzwords to us. These, these are sentiments reflecting that um, it's important to have a worldview and to work on it pretty daily 
where you see that your point of view is not the ultimate superior point of view and try to understand people uh, from wherever they come. So here we're using the word culture to go beyond um, gender identity, religion, um, we're including politics, um, disabilities, and abilities, so that cultural humility is allowing, our hope is allowing you to step aside and see the world from somebody else's point of view and, and connect on that level. Thank you. So um, again, these affirmations are on that corner. And on behalf of the newly named EAC committee, we wish all of you a wonderful, fantastic year. And may the force be with you. Those of you that don't know us, I'm Joan Duffy. I'm the faculty coordinator of Student Health Services. This is my third year at Cuesta. I'm Tanya Leonard. I just changed my name yesterday, so. <laughs> anyway, it's Tanya Leonard. And we really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about what we do in health services. How many of you honestly have made your way to the Student Health Center? Awesome. Okay. Please do, and if you haven't been in a while, come back. We've moved things around a little bit this summer. We're super excited about how that's going to impact the services that we provide. So we invite you to come and see it so that when you refer student to, students to us, you actually know, um, you know what it's going to look like and what their experience might be. We want to talk to you a little bit about how we impact student success and kind of the holistic approach that we take to serving students in the health center. So obviously, holistically, we're going to look at the physical part of taking care of people, the kind of medical nursing side of it. We do have walk-in services for students' health. We have an RN who is um, staffing the health center every single day here on the SLO campus, and then moving to four days a week on the North County campus, which we think is going to be a really positive change. We have a phenomenal nurse practitioner that is there two and a half days a week um, providing care for services. We're not an urgent care center. We're not a mini hospital, so we can't do everything. But we do do a huge amount of referring students to services, students to services that we can't provide. So even if you're not sure, you know, last year we had a student who laid his motorcycle down a couple times um, coming to Cuesta, walked in to us with a broken tooth. Well, we can't fix teeth, but boy, we found a place for him to go that day. So even if you're not sure, encourage students to come over and we'll try to figure out where they can get care. We also do screening and wellness clinics throughout the year, um, flu shots, cholesterol screening. So if your students are interested in those services, please send them our way. And I'm just going to share with you a little bit about we do, what we do on the mental health side. Um, how many of you are aware that we do have therapists available on campus? To, okay, great. Good. Good. So, yeah, we were lucky enough last year to actually get a grant from the foundation, and we started an intern program. So we have a little bit more services than we have had in the past, and we're going to, we got the grant again this year, so we're going to continue this year. So we have myself and two interns, Jill Lizabee and Janet Flores are our interns. So we are able to get students in a little bit quicker now, within a week or two weeks, to see a therapist, which is really great. Our students here at Cuesta get three to six sessions per semester, which is a pretty good deal. They are able to uh, schedule those appointments, see a therapist, and um, they make a lot of progress in three to six sessions, believe it or not. We're working with them on um, really just having a safe place to come and express who they are and be genuine and feel like, you know, it's a trusting environment. And that's where we start with the therapeutic relationship and it makes all the difference to have a good confidential place to share what's hurting you and then we're working um, mostly focusing on and i work on and, and working with the interns is cognitive behavioral therapy so we're really teaching our students that 
what they think affects how they feel, and that affects how they behave. And um, in doing that, they start to learn how to be more present, and we work on mindfulness and just being where they are. Uh, our society has become such an ancient society. We hear negative information every day on the news, and our students are, they really are great people who are really motivated and want to do well, but sometimes they're thinking way too far in the future, and our culture has sort of uh, exacerbated that with kind of this whole idea if we don't know what, where we're going, uh, we won't get anywhere, and it, that's not the truth. <laughs> so um, this is a great place to learn and be present, and that's what we're helping our students with. So they get three to six sessions. What we're seeing mostly in the health center, the majority of our students come in with anxiety and depression. Joan's going to share in a, in a minute some stats on uh, that kind of shows where that's coming from and the high percentages. But we're also dealing with students that are dealing with relationship problems. Oftentimes people come away from home and they've had a hard home life and they have not been safe in their own home environment. They get away to college and they're not quite sure how to navigate through the world and who's safe and who's not. So uh, relationships is something that we're often working on and helping them to have good effective communication skills. and be able just to come talk to the staff and faculty here at Quest and trust that we're going to be here to help them. So um, those eating disorders is often something we don't treat eating disorders, but we will refer out. Um, I noticed on this list is not uh, the LGBTQ community. We're often assisting those students in helping with their um, dealing with any concerns they have about their sexual identity, the coming out process, and also just feeling safe. How can they feel safe? Who do they feel safe with? Um, so that's really important work that we're doing, uh, loss and grief. Um, we're going to talk more in a minute. So we're helping students that are not in crisis in those three to six sessions. And they make tremendous progress. It really does make a difference. And I feel really blessed to have the opportunity to work with students and help them in that area. I'm going to talk in a little bit about what to do if they are in crisis. So the next few slides I'm just going to kind of zip through because it's numbers. Some of you love it, some of you don't. But this last spring, 2006, we were able to participate in the American College Health Association National College Health Association II survey, which kind of profiles our students at Cuesta and kind of emerging health trends. So this information is looking at um, kind of the things that students identified as part of that survey. So this slide reflects the percentage of Cuesta students that responded to the survey in the things that impact their academic success. And you can see up there, this is kind of standard with what we found when we ran the survey three years ago. The top ones, stress, anxiety, um, relationship difficulties, sleep difficulties, and work. Keep hitting the wrong button. This is the percentage of Cuesta students that reported the following. Um, felt overwhelmingly sad, 62%. Felt overwhelming anxiety, 63%. Felt overwhelmed by all they had to do, 83% of our students. Those aren't just students in the health center, those are our students. And I know you all see that every single day. This slide reflects the percentage of students who are students, your students, who were diagnosed or treated by a professional in the last 12 months. So 26% of your students were diagnosed or treated for anxiety, 20% for depression, and 15 for panic attack. How many of them weren't diagnosed or treated? How many of them were too overwhelmed to access care? It's kind of overwhelming statistic. And the last one is the number of percentage of Cuesta students that responded to the survey that reported the following within the last 12 months. You can see on there, 45% of our students reported more than average stress, 33% plus average stress, and greater than 12% tremendous stress. So if you kind of do the math, how many students are sitting in your classroom? Um, and you know, we look a lot at like, okay, so if you're highly stressed, are you functioning up, up here? You're really not. You're kind of functioning back at that base level of your brain. You're in that kind of fight or flight response. So we do spend a lot of time trying to get students 
out of this place and back into this place so that they can be successful in your classroom. Okay, great. So what do we do? So that, you know, we have lots of great services. We really feel good about it. But I do need to talk about something that's very difficult to, to talk about, and that is that students do get into situations where they are suicidal. And we did have a suicide uh, of one of our students uh, last year, it was last spring. And in the month of January and February, there were eight suicides in our community that directly affected our students. And we were just slammed in the health center. Um, all three of the therapists and the nurses were heavily working with students on grief. Um, they were a loss of siblings, loss of roommates, um, family members and friends. And then, of course, we had a Cuesta student. So it is something that is difficult to talk about, but important. Um, so we have um, felt that it's important to kind of let everybody know what can we do if we really are afraid that a student is in danger of hurting themselves. So everybody has this card on their chair. And it just gives you some quick tips about what to look for in terms of signs that a student may be at risk. Um, and these are students that you know, are in situations that you know, are above and beyond what an instructor can handle in their classroom. But they need, oftentimes, instructors are the first to see this, OK? So um, it, you know, expressing hopelessness easily agitated, extremely disruptive, you know, might be in class, maybe they're getting up and down, they, they have high extreme levels of anxiety. Increased drug and alcohol use is always a high risk factor. Giving away belongings, that often if a student tells you I gave away my pet or uh, that kind of thing that particular student last year had given away a pet or belongings. Um, Withdrawal, kind of made, they stop showing up to class. That can be a sign of high risk. Um, kind of expressing a lack of purpose, not knowing why they're here, reckless behavior. Um, I notice what's not on here is, you know, mood swings. So a student may, you may see their mood go way down. But also what may, what may happen if you recognize a student that has been maybe sad, um, and all of a sudden they seem to be elated and everything seems to be fine, that can also be a sign that they are considering suicide and have decided that that will be the solution to their problems. So we have to be careful with that, too. We don't want to think that because somebody seems fine now that everything's OK. We still want to check in with them. So those are some things to look for. But what do you do? How do you, you know, once you see these signs, how do we help these students? And it's a difficult thing to approach, but very, very important. And so, you know, we on the bottom of this card, it talks about um, assessing for risk of suicide, then listening non-judgmentally, providing reassurance. So we want to make students feel comfortable. We can get you help and encourage them to get appropriate services. But we start off with that assessing for risk of suicide. And the thing that is really important, and it tells you assess for suicide in this green box, it's very important that you ask directly, are you thinking of killing yourself? It's a difficult question to ask. Um, and we'll talk about some, we have further training available on campus where you can practice some of this. But it is a hard question to ask. A lot of people are afraid that if you ask this question that it's going to encourage that thought. Uh, what you will, I have asked, I literally ask this question on a daily basis, and unfortunately, in my work. And it really does provide a sense of relief for the student and whoever you're speaking to. It helps them to understand that you see that that is an option people think about, and it's real. It just, you'll see them give a sigh of relief. And sometimes they may say, I've thought about it. I wish that I wouldn't wake up in the morning, but I would never do that because you know, I love my family, I, you know, my kids are so important to me, or my friends. Or If you hear a reason why they wouldn't do it, then you know you can start to refer them to services. But if they say, yeah, I, I, I don't see any reason for being here, I, I've thought of killing myself, then you want to go to the next question, which is, do you have a plan? Have you thought about how you might do that? 
And often this times people will start to cry as they share the reality of having very seriously thought about the thought of killing themselves. And, you know, sometimes the answer will be, no, I, I've never thought about a plan. I don't think I would do that. Okay, then you're good. But sometimes the answer is, yes, I have a plan. And, um, and then you listen non-judgmentally to what the plan is, and then you ask, do they have the means? When are you going to do it? How are you going to do it? Do you have what it takes to do it? I had a student in North County on one occasion who was planning on shooting himself. He did have a gun um, at his home, and we had to have the police go remove his weapon and put him in a safer situation. So there, we always want to remove the means. That is not your job. But once you've asked these questions, are they thinking of killing themselves? Do they have a plan? Do they have the means? you know the student, if they've answered yes to more than one of the questions, is at high risk. And at that point, um, you want to seek immediate help for them. So oftentimes, for staff and faculty, they find out this information not with the student sitting in front of them. Sometimes they're at home grading papers and the student has written a note, I'm, you know, or in their office, that I'm feeling hopeless. I don't want to live anymore, or some indication of hopelessness. Or sometimes you have a relationship with a student and they choose to email you and tell you that I don't see any reason for being here anymore. So here you are, you've got an email or a paper and you're very concerned about the student. What do you do? They're not sitting right in front of you. Or if they are sitting right in front of you, what you need to do if they're not sitting in front of you is find out where they're at. So you might access their phone number or email and say, where are you located right now? I'm concerned about you. You want to know where they're at. Because your next step is they have answered yes to more than one of these questions, is you want somebody to actually contact them and make sure that they are safe and that they get to a professional that can do an appropriate evaluation and get them the help they need. And since the health center is not always open, we're not always there to call or email. And we have received emails on a Friday night when an instructor is concerned or a Saturday, and then I don't get it till Monday. So what we want to do is if you're on campus, if the student is on campus, you want to call campus police. They are trained to evaluate and contact the mobile crisis team and have students what's called 5150, which is placed sometimes against their will uh, at county mental health till they can get the proper help they need and make sure that they have a safety plan. Um, or they may just do a safety plan with them. And that's contacting family members, making sure somebody's going to be there for them, making sure they have the services available. If they are off campus, you want to call the local police department. Give them the name of the student, the address that they're located at. Confidentiality goes out the door when we are concerned about somebody's life. So for safety, you do not have to worry about that if you are truly concerned. So I know this is a super hard topic to talk about, um, but it is real. Uh, we have suicides happening in our county on a regular basis and just in society, and we have to think about it. There's also the possibility of homicidal behavior, and we also always want to ask about that, and it's something that has been a big concern when we've seen shootings and things on campus. Reaching out and letting people know that you care about them can make the difference. Um, just so you know, if once this has happened, then we want to be able to, well, how do we let people know on campus that maybe the student, once they've gotten help from in a crisis, we want them to come back to Cuesta and be healthy and do well in their classes. We want them to be set up with services. So once you've been in that situation, or if in any situation you are in with students and you feel like the student needs more than you can provide in a classroom setting, we'd like you to fill out a student incident report, or it can be a well-being concern report. This report goes to the Vice President of Student Services Office. It's located on the Vice President of Student Services page. We're working on getting it moved 
It's on Quick Link? Oh, yay. In my on forms. Oh, yay. Okay, so on my Questa, it's under Quick Links forms. It's under forms. So you can find it quickly now. It has been buried for years. Thank you. I'm so happy about that. So uh, you can find it under forms easily. And the thing about it is sometimes we're a little concerned about a student, but we're not quite sure. We're kind of, eh, behavior seems a little different. But the problem what we found is oftentimes when a student finally gets to the point they're in really in crisis, we find out that there might have been a staff person and a couple faculty that noticed something but weren't sure, but they didn't file a well-being report, so we had no idea. But if we know that there's kind of problems being noticed in several different areas on campus, the vice president's office will call the student in and offer services and let them know that we're concerned and how can we help them and um, it is really meant to to help them get what they need before they get to crisis so if you can do this anytime you're concerned certainly if you have to um, deal with a crisis file this report when you get back to campus so that when the student, if they are hospitalized or not, we can provide them with, with services. The other thing that happens with the um, counseling center, the mental health counseling and the health center is that oftentimes, you know, our students do great in three to six sessions and then we have students who have more serious problems. The onset of mental health problems is from age 15 to 25. So oftentimes, these are our students that come here, and so we have so many students who come away from home to Cuesta, that they're away from their families and they start to have mental health problems and their families don't even know that they have a kid that's dealing with mental health issues and they don't know what it is. It scares them and they're not sure and they're embarrassed and afraid to say something. So if we can reach out when we see behavior that looks odd or different or if any concern, then we can sometimes educate them and we will continue to see them at the health center until we can get them set up with more extensive services outside. So we don't say you're not appropriate for the health center and we think maybe we're dealing with a more serious diagnosis like schizophrenia or something like that. We say we want to help you, we want to make sure you're in services and get what you need and we keep them with us until that transition is made. So. So that, I wanted you just to be aware of that too. So anyways, I know this is a really difficult topic to talk about. I wanna take a minute just to kind of get ourselves back centered and thank you so much for allowing me to talk to you about it. But if we can just dim the lights, um, it's very, so if I can just take a minute and ask everybody to just close your eyes for a moment. I'm gonna ask you just to take three deep breaths all the way into your abdomen and very slowly release. And just give yourself a minute to be present in the room, feel the air, the temperature of the room, any sound you might be hearing, what you're smelling, just be completely present. Just take a moment to just breathe naturally. Feel yourself breathing in peace, letting out any tension as you breathe out. Feel yourself breathing in calmness, releasing any worries, and feel yourself breathing in serenity, and just letting go of any stress. Just continue to breathe naturally. And then just take a moment, and when you're ready, you can open your eyes again.
So I know this is a very difficult um, topic, but important, and we certainly want to be there for you and for our students. And I just want to end with this quote, um, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. And, and there's been controversy about who actually said that, but Plato often gets credit. But the main point is kindness has always made a difference. So um, be kind to yourself. Um, we're really blessed to be working in an environment where we help improve people's lives. And I feel really blessed to be working with all of you and that we are all dedicated to that. So be kind to yourself and all those around you and have a great semester. I was out. <laughs> Thank you for that respite. Yeah. I <laughs> got my mind off of several things. <clears throat> Thank you for that. But thank you also for the seriousness of the message. Um, I remember in, <clears throat> in the early 90s when we opened our student health center, and I remember looking at the stats uh, from Vicki Sazak, who would share those with me as the vice president, and, you know, probably 80% of the of the presenting issues around colds, flus, uh, and those kind of incidental things that happen. Very little, uh, very little impact that we were seeing that we would consider under mental health issues. And I think part of that was based on just our ignorance, our ignorance of really what to look for, or really understanding uh, the relationship between academic performance, student behavior, and life issues. And that's become so much more prevalent and we've become so much more aware and more educated that we're now seeing the relationship. I mean, in those early 90s, it was easy for me to kick somebody out of school because they weren't conforming, you know, behaviorally or academically and say, you need to do time out. You need to spend a semester out of here. <clears throat> but as we learn more, it was about, wait a minute, these behaviors and actions are really symptomatic of something more deeply going on in that young person's or older person's life. And so we started to take time to really look and peel the onion back and say, okay, what's really causing this? Is it the fact that you're just not smart enough to succeed in, in Math 232? Or, or is there something else going on in your life that's preventing you from focusing Maybe it's a learning disability. Maybe it's an emotional issue. Maybe it's a, a substance abuse. Maybe you're on medication but not taking it or abusing it. So the shift has been extremely important. And we all play a role in that. We all play a role because we're the boots on the ground people that are touching the lives of students every day. And if we, and I don't want you going around examining people for behavior issues, but you know it when you see it. It's different, it's odd, it's uncomfortable. So take, take the opportunity to maybe help that young person's life by doing a well-being report. And it may be incidental, but it may be a pattern of behavior that our professionals need to step in and be proactive in helping this young person. Um, the most graphic thing for me was <clears throat> about uh, 10 years ago, when I was in my pseudo retirement stage and I was teaching part time and I had a student in my class. Um, she was probably in her early thirties, um, very, um, very engaged in her teaching or her learning. Um, she wasn't the greatest math student. She was in a math 232 class that I was teaching, uh, but she was really serious about being successful. She utilized office hours, all the things that we were talking about that helped students success. And then uh, the semester was over, and this is a spring term. And then uh, over the summer, I read an article in the newspaper that somebody had jumped off the parking structure downtown San Luis Obispo, attempting to end their life. But unfortunately, they landed feet first. They survived, but crushed both legs to the point where both legs were amputated. And um, 
And I was stunned. I was just stunned by the fact that I was not aware, I did not see any symptom at all or gave me any concern other than somebody really taking responsibility for their learning. Well, about two semesters following that, I ran into her again on campus. She was in a wheelchair. Uh, she had come back to school. She was um, back in classes. She looked happy. She was, uh, came by to thank me for uh, the class that she was in. Three weeks later, she killed herself. And that has haunted me for the last 10 years, thinking about what, where in that presence, in that conversation, did somebody not see it? Why did I not see something or recognize something or others that work here at the institution? Um, so I've become a lot more mindful and a lot more present in terms of working not only with students but also with staff because all of us are challenged by life's issues. And it's incumbent upon us, as Tanya was saying, about being kind and present in each other's lives, to recognize situations in which might um, give us pause or cause to think about that somebody's in crisis. So thank you for that presentation today, because I think as I was drifting off in that one period, <clears throat> that I felt, I felt everybody present in terms of the message that you were working with. And that's another aspect of what I was talking about earlier, and that is about student success. You know, what are we doing to provide the right environment and climate for our students to be successful? And so uh, Larry and I uh, had a conversation about student success um, last spring, about bringing that forward as a major topic for this particular session today. So uh, Larry is going to open this little session, <clears throat> and then I'm going to try to help. help. Yeah, <laughs> right. And not, <clears throat> and just, <clears throat> not get in the way. <clears throat> Hello again. Opening day is a wonderful opportunity for us to start the new academic year by sharing our goals and initiatives and projects and to celebrate the success of our talented colleagues um, with awards and other recognitions um, that we witnessed earlier today. This year we are also using this opportunity, as Dr. Stork said, to embrace the reason that we are all here at Cuesta, and that is to help our students achieve their academic goals. Sometimes it may be hard to remember this, but all of us who are here today, whether a staff member, an administrator, a faculty member, or a member of the Board of Trustees, we are all here for the same purpose. And that purpose is to serve our students, um, to help them at Cuesta College succeed at Cuesta College. Dr. Stork and I have invited several people to help us identify how each employee of Cuesta College complete, contributes to student success. So if those people could um, start coming on up here. And while they're on their way up here, um, oh yeah, you're supposed to talk next. Go ahead, you're supposed to say that. <laughs> Good right there. Sure. Okay. We have a hand. Oh, there we go. So, uh, Lara, as, as our, um, why don't you slide down? Yeah, thanks, Tommy. So, as our, our uh, colleagues here are assembling uh, before us, um, let me ask you a question. What do, you, what do you do as the Academic Senate President do for student success? How do you contribute? As the Academic Senate President, I contribute to student success by ensuring that all policies and procedures related to student success are carefully considered by the faculty through the work of the Academic Senate Council. Dr. Stork, what do you do to contribute to student success? <laughs> I didn't know this was going to be a quiz. <laughs> Well, you know, um, I don't have direct contact with students on a daily basis. But what I do do that I think is probably the most important thing I do is I hire the most outstanding and talented faculty and administrative staff 
in order to provide the appropriate and significant environment for our students to achieve their own personal success. So, yeah, how was that? Pretty good, huh? And, you know, uh, as I was thinking and, and as Larry as I was talking about this, you know, each of us has a role. And somehow we touch the lives of students. And uh, we've asked this group here from all walks of the campus to come forward and um, just share a, a minute about who they are, what they do, how long they've been here, and what do they do? How do they see their role in supporting student success? And uh, we'll start with Tommy. Yeah, go, go Tommy, take it. Yeah, there is no teleprompter. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Tommy Jin, groundskeeper, uh, 17 years. Yeah. And then how do you sing? How do you, how do you uh, contribute to student success? Uh, I support student success by making the fields nice for the players and coaches. Yeah. Hi, I'm Lisa DeFrega. I'm in the history department. This is my 11th year at Cuesta. And um, everything we've heard earlier today really is what I use to support student success. I take advantage shamelessly of all of the wonderful resources we have here at Cuesta. Um, the DSPS department we have is outstanding. Two of my favorite gals right here. Joe and Christine, and Lauren, who runs uh, the department, and Judy Rittmiller. I try to encourage all of my students um, who I think may be having learning issues or physical issues to go to DSPS. And, you know, I think a lot of times there's a stigma. Students are ashamed or embarrassed about something that they feel is a challenge. And I, I try to reassure them that they are dealing with wonderful people who have, you know, the, the most recent information at their fingertips on how to improve um, any student's ability to learn to their best potential. And I also personally, um, you know, in addition to all the teacher stuff I do, go to the textbook site, et cetera, et cetera, I just try to make myself very available to my students probably annoy the crap out of my colleagues a lot of times because my office door is always open. And even if a student is not talking to me about something related directly to class, I love getting to know them as much as possible on a personal level because then I feel like I can really more thoroughly tailor how I am going to teach them. I mean, it's a lot. Many of us are teaching, you know, hundreds of students each semester, but as often as we can, I think, trying to get to know them as individuals to find out what unique challenges they have in their lives, that allows us to be a much more effective instructor. Um, and just the last thing, um, with student health, I just, I have to thank that department too. I've referred probably six students to student health um, in my 11 years here, six students who were um, I don't know at what level of crisis, but certainly had some issues going on. And without exception, they all later, when talking to them and catching up, um, said your department helped them tremendously with referrals and therapy, so thank you. Hi, I'm Kathy Babb. I'm the Division Assistant for Physical Sciences and Biology. Sometimes I help out the math faculty a little bit, too. <laughs> I've been at Cuesta for 31 years, and I actually moved to San Luis Obispo 60 years ago, so I've been here half my life. <laughs> I could be a member of the club you were talking about, right, the fifth year club. But I help. Um, I'm there every day in my office, and I help. Well, it's an open lobby area, but I'm there available for the students, help them find their classrooms, and I help them locate their instructors when they're stressed out. So that's it. <laughs> I'm Lori Oshiyama, Admissions and Records Coordinator. I'm starting my 26th year at Cuesta. 
and I support student success by helping students complete the admission application process and registering for classes. But I also have a magnet on my wall, and it says, nobody knows what I do until I don't do it. So <laughs> ad codes have been generated by our department this morning. So if we didn't do it, then you would know. So they are available. So there are other things we do in admissions and records behind the scenes that you don't know about it until something happens like that. Well, I kind of want to introduce myself to Kathy right here. I didn't know that was Kathy Babb, Janet Shepherd. <laughs> We've just been exchanging emails, but I am the Director of Grant Development. I've been at Cuesta for almost a year, and I support student success by bringing in more money for programs and services through corporate grants, foundation grants, and government grants. Hi, I'm Casey DiBernardi, and I am the Interim Supervisor of the Student Success Center. And I've been at Cuesta for about nine and a half years, and I support student success by ensuring that in the Student Success Center, we have top-notch tutors in multiple subjects that are available to assist our students. Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Glenda Moscoso, and I've been at Cuesta for 20 years, 11 of those as a counselor. And I help support student success by providing a supporting environment for the students where we can really have honest conversations about their dreams, their aspirations, their goals. And sometimes we have to talk about the challenges that are on their ways for the students, you know, things that they need to overcome in, in order to achieve those goals. And then the most fun part is when I help them develop a plan that will help them achieve those goals. And the, the reward is when I, hear, you know, I receive a phone call at a card telling me the student that is graduating from college and universities and achieving their dreams. So I love what I do and I feel very honored to help our students. Thank you. My name is Lauren Buckingham and I am fortunate enough to work with Disabled Student Programs and Services. I started at Cuesta in 1998 at the North County campus when it opened. <laughs> and I've been dabbling around ever since. I've been in DSPS since 2008. And I wrote my thoughts in a little nutshell on a card, so forgive me while I read what I do. I think I need the magnet that says, I don't know what I do until somebody <laughs> tells me that I'm not doing it. <laughs> I have a little new role happening this year. OK, I support student success by connecting students to services and accommodations that create equal access to learning and achievement here at Cuesta. Hi, I'm Marie Larson, and I'm um, a mathematics instructor in the mathematics division chair. And as an instructor, I, I would echo the sentiments of Lisa DeFraga. Um, I have an open door policy. Students often sort of camp in my office. And there's a super secret room down the hall that I always tell them about, so it's really not a secret. Um, say, go there, because my office is right down the hall, come by. So that's how I do that. As a division chair, I support and encourage our marvelous mathematics faculty for all that they do. And um, I encourage everyone to work with student equity and student success. I had been wanting to develop an online program for students to either A, improve their assessment, get ready for a class, or remediate. And I've been trying to find a vehicle to make that happen, and we were able to do that through student equity. There are free vouchers for them to access this software, and it's amazing. So, yay. Hi, I'm Kevin Bonton Ball. I'm a librarian here at Cuesta. This is the start of my 19th year at Cuesta. And I, as well as all the other librarians here at Cuesta, um, support student success by helping students become knowledgeable consumers of information, efficient and effective researchers, and lifelong learners. Hi, I'm uh, Bob Mariucci, the Director of Athletics. And as you all know, I've been here 15 years. Um, I support student success, and I'm going to say this, our whole department supports the student success by ensuring that our student athletes are receiving the most positive and rewarding collegiate experience in their respective sports. And I'm going to say this, and more importantly, is that 
our entire department and myself supporting student success is that we are ensuring that our student athletes are academically ready to transfer to a four-year institution. You stole my line. I was going to say our department, but anyway. I'm Jason Hopkins. I'm the sergeant with the campus police department. I've been here 14 years. Next year I get my pin. <laughs> um, our department supports student success by providing a safe and secure learning environment. Yeah. My name is Brian McAllister. I've been with Cuesta College uh, for about 13 years um, now. I'm the assistant director of Bond Projects, and uh, I support student success by ensuring new construction and modifications provide an accessible, safe, and secure learning environment to promote student success. Yeah. Hi, I'm Steve Marinelli. I've been here for 26 years, the first 10 on the athletic fields. And I, am, uh, I support student success by being committed to providing a welcoming campus environment. And anybody who knows me, I'm pretty much an engaging person, so I'll ask students before they ask me if they need help. Yeah. Well, Lara, what do you think? Do you think we've got some committed people that help support student success? Yes, I think so, and I think there are probably more out there. Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, Matt, thank you for mentioning that. <laughs> uh, on your seats is a card, and uh, what I'd like you to do, either now or sometime today or in the next week, sit down and think about something that you contribute to student success and if you do it today, there's a basket over in the corner to drop it in. Otherwise, just put it in campus mail to get it up to my office. And we're going to use these uh, as testimonies throughout the year in various publications and media presentations or documents just to look at the, uh, the breadth and engagement of each and every one of us that are supporting student success in so many different ways. So thank you to our volunteers that I asked to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I did give them the opportunity to say no, but none of them took me up on it. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, I know Tommy, Tommy, uh, Jen said, oh no, do I have to do this? I don't like to speak in public. Don't make me do this. I said, you're going to do it, Tommy. Yeah. Yeah. Because I do believe, and sometimes we don't, we don't connect the dots sometimes in our roles to see how, how what we do and the, the uh, commitment we make to that particular task does contribute to student success. So I want you to feel that no matter what your role is, where you're assigned, what kind of job, what kind of location you're performing that task, is it does have an impact on a student being able to reach their self-identified goal. So I want to thank you very much today. And what I appreciate most about this morning is the tremendous respect and appreciation you've shown uh, for your colleagues. You know, those newly hired who we've just welcomed into the Cuesta family, those achieving the longevity milestones in their Cuesta careers, those being recognized by their peers as leaders in excellence as teachers, support staff, and administrators. And my congratulations go out again to Chris and Sherry and Claudia and Kristen, and to Bill Demarest, who I had the privilege of selecting for his exceptional leadership as co-chair of the Educational Facilities Master Planning Process. And those of you who prepared and made presentations uh, related to the student success theme today, uh, to Maria and Joan and Tanya and Lara, to those uh, of you also who have taken the opportunity to, to show your enthusiastic support for each of these presentations. So what is all this noise about student success? These words appear in almost every document that we produce or we receive from the state of California. 
It's part of our values statement. It appears in the accreditation standard. It has become the umbrella metric by which we are being judged by the Board of Governors for the community colleges and the state legislature. So let me ask you this. When is Cuesta College considered having contributed to enhancing student success? Is it having high marks on the scorecard metrics determined by the Chancellor's Office? Is it issuing more and more associate degrees for transfer? Is it helping an English language learner progress to successfully master English 201A? Is it assisting an undecided student to find a career path that excites him or her? Is it being designated as a Hispanic serving institution or a veterans friendly institution? Is it having gold medal winners at the National Skills USA competition in Louisville, Kentucky? Is it watching a student stuck in pre-algebra for the three semesters finally qualify for elementary algebra? Is it when your grade distribution in your class is 70% A's and B's? Or is it witnessing a student taking one class that allows her or him to qualify for a pay raise or a promotion? So who is to say what student success is and when student success has been achieved? Is it the U.S. Department of Education, the State of California, the Board of Governors, the Chancellor's Office, the Cuesta Board of Trustees, the College President, or you who deliver the instruction and services to our students? Or is it the students themselves? Some are very clear as to what they want and are pretty sure as to how to achieve that goal. Others need remediation, but with some ultimate focus on the end game. And there are others who just don't have a clue of what to do or how to do it. So I took a look at the student characteristics of our currently enrolled. Uh, we have almost 8,500 students uh, today uh, enrolled at Cuesta College. Next week, we'll be enrolling another 1,700 or so dual enrollment students in all of our 11 high school districts in, in the county, uh, which is an amazing uh, growth and expansion uh, to date. So this is a, our best glimpse of what our students want to accomplish at Cuesta. And this is based on the self-reported check the bubble on the application, which may not be 100% accurate, because I know for a fact some students fill out, I want to be a transfer student because that's what my mom and dad want me to do, you know, and they don't have a clue what that means. But anyway, so just to give you a thumbnail set about what the self-reported uh, goal is that the students have stated. So for every 20 students that walk in our door, 12 have a desire to transfer to a four-year university, and nine of those 12, including the wanting to complete an associate degree along the way, many of those the associate degree for transfer. Two of these students want to complete a career or technical degree or vocational certificate but, but not transfer. Two more are looking to prepare for a new career or upgrade job skills or maintain a license. One is attempting to improve basic skills or other educational development. One is a university student who's here at Cuesta taking GE courses to complete their degree, most of whom are from Cal Poly. And one is an undecided, is undecided about any goal at this particular point. Now, to, big, to get a better idea of the number of students in, these, in each of these categories, you know I'd not deliver an address without some mathematical challenge in it. So, so there, is a, there is a factor of 425 that you apply to each of those particular categories. So for instance, the 12 students, if you multiply that by 425, that's 5,100 of our students have a transfer intent a transfer intent either with or without the associate degree. Now that shifts as you look at the population for San Luis Obispo campus as to the Paso Robles campus. On this campus, it's about two in three have a transfer intent. At the North County campus, it's about one in two. So the shift is on focus in terms of what students are looking for. So what point am I trying to make of all this? Well, about 12 years ago, when I uh, retired as the Vice President of Student Service and went back to teaching mathematics on a part-time basis, 
I decided to do something different with my students. I was teaching an introductory st uh, statistics class in a section of college algebra. In the previous 40 years of teaching, I would normally have students fill out a three by five card collecting you know, typical information such as um, their previous educational experience, like high school, other colleges that they've attended, their major, what their previous math experiences were like. Um, pretty typical of many of the faculty that do this. However, I decided to add another question that I'd never included before. And that question focused on what would success feel like for that particular student in this class? A moment to define that success. Is it a C? And I usually did it in terms of a, a letter grade. Now think of it. You're teaching Math 232. This is a terminal math course for most non-science, non-mathematics majors. So what do you think their ultimate goal is? Just to get the course off the list, you know. <laughs> and so you're looking to the faces of these people and say, I don't want to be here, you know. Um, but then you think you have one last chance to change their opinion about mathematics, you know. <laughs> one last opportunity that they walk away saying, that wasn't so bad after all, but I'm never going to take it again, you know. <laughs> So how did that change my perception? Well, I used to really look at, you know, was I successful in teaching the class? And I was usually measuring that by how many A's and B's my students got. If they got more A's and B's, and I thought, wow, you know, I was really successful. But it wasn't about me. It was really about, are my students successful? Are they achieving the, the um, student learning outcomes that you've identified in your courses and programs? Are they really fulfilling what they want to fulfill in their particular area? So if they identify that I just want to get a C and out of here, and what if they're performing at an A or a B level? Well, it would be an opportunity for me to step in and say, you know, you've got some really talent and skill. You know, maybe you should reassess what you want to accomplish. And maybe this assessment is actually going to influence maybe what they want to do in terms of a career option. Maybe they want to take another, maybe they want to take, heaven forbid, statistics. Yeah. Maybe they're a social science major and they need to have statistics in order to be able to interpret data, et cetera. So the point here is, it appears to me in this day and age that student success is determined for us and our students by external facets. Legislative Board of Governors, Chancellor's Office. The focus is on metrics. And, and they're trying to compare us with the university model, which is really all about bachelor's degrees and getting people out in time. Is it important that our students earn degrees, successfully transfer or get jobs? Well, absolutely, that's important. But it's only important if that's what they want to accomplish. You know, we are a come-as-you-are system of higher education. We don't make students come through a cookie cutter. They have to come in all looking the same with the same GPA and the same academic performance in high school and so on. We take them on face value. They have a self-defined objective of coming to college or they're searching to establish one. And it's not really our role to come in and tell them what they should do or who they should be or what they should become. We can help them in that process. So we can't forget to take the time to ask our students, what does success mean to them? And if they're not, if their stated goal is a C and they're performing at a D or F level, you know, we, need to, we need to intervene with them and say, you know, you're now in jeopardy of not reaching your stated goal. What is it that we can do to help you do that? And get them connected with the services that we provide for them and monitoring the potential danger of not achieving their goal. What I learned in this five-year interlude in my quest to journey before I accepted this role as president was that what it mattered greatly to my students that I cared about what they wanted to achieve as an outcome? Did that mean that I didn't challenge them to stretch beyond their goal? No, but I didn't build the expectations for success so high 
so that no matter what they achieve, they interpret that as a failure. And I've seen that with my own children. You, know, you set the expectations for them, and for some of them, they have a, don't have any desire to be at that level. And so every day then becomes a challenge of feeling uh, self-accomplished. We're all aware, uh, all aware that every role we play here at Cuesta College somehow supports our students in achieving their goals. That's our job. That is what we do. We heard testimony today of how it's being done, and we're asking you to share that uh, with the rest of us today or in the future. Creating a supportive, caring, and safe environment for our students goes a long way to assisting in this process. We've accomplished so much over these past seven years that shape the culture of this institution that supports student success. We have demonstrated compliance with all of the accreditation standards and policies. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. We have developed a planning process that is owned by you, it's assessed by you, and it's improved by you. We have passed a bond issue that is allowing us to create and upgrade facilities that will enhance our abilities to do our jobs and for students to achieve their goals. We have implemented the Promise Scholarship that is opening up access to more and more local high school graduates to pursue their college education by lessening the financial barrier. That scholarship in the three years that we have awarded, including this fall, has now affected 2,100 students to date. In the fall of 2014, we awarded uh, almost 650 scholarships. Last fall, it was about 700. And this fall, we're going to hit probably 750. Um, <clears throat> now, that's good news and bad news. The good news is we're opening the door for local students to get a leg up without burdening themselves with a tremendous college debt. The bad news is we're really challenging uh, our foundation, uh, fiscal office, and Rick Camarillo especially. <laughs> we're going to refer him to the Student Health Center, I think, uh, <laughs> because the endowment only spits out so much money a year, and we're right up, we're starting to push the envelope. So what does that mean? That means for me and for Shannon, our job is to go out and find more donors to add to that endowment. And that's our commitment. The other commitment that I'm making and have made, and we've begun work on this, within the next two years, we will fund a second year for the Promise Scholarship so that every student who chooses to come will have two years. The second year will have some academic progress requirements. The first year is about access. The second year is, OK, now that you've gotten an opportunity, demonstrate that you deserve the second year. That's already been implemented this fall for about 18 to 20 Coast Union High School graduates who were here this last year on the Promise Scholarship. A donor came forward in Cambria and gave us $20,000 to put to the foundation to pay for those uh, continuing students from Coast Union High School to have their fee-free second year. So it's already started. Uh, but all I need is $10 million. So, uh, <clears throat> so that basket, if you don't put your card in, we, <laughs> we can certainly help in any way that you can, uh, you know, give me your old Jamba Juice cards or something, yeah. <laughs> Another way that we have demonstrated our commitment to student success is we have hired outstanding faculty, staff, and administrators who have all demonstrated your passion for their chosen work and its effect on student success. In closing, I want to continue to say thank you to all of you of what you do every day to assist students and also to assist each other. I look forward to another successful school year and best wishes to all of you. Have a good day.
And with that, we're out of here. Thank you.